Log lady. Right. Hi. A television series that quickly became a phenomenon and then just as quickly fizzled to an end once people had their fill of saying, it's not just me, that was weird, right? She's dead. Wrapped in plastic. It started off as a murder mystery that slowly revealed the quirks of a small town before going all in on a shared hallucination. Don't ruin that too! Twin Peaks. You were placed under arrest for suspicion of murder. The murder of Laura Palmer. The prom queen being found dead and wrapped in plastic has echoes of an earlier crime, which leads to an FBI agent teaming up with the local sheriff to investigate the murder. The town of Twin Peaks is a sleepy lumber town with ordinary people who, as it turns out, are anything but ordinary. Lots of thought has gone into scholarly dissections and interpretations of Twin Peaks. Dale. It's much like Patrick McGowan's 1960 series, The Prisoner where everyone will tell you that they know for an absolute certainty what everything means. David Lynch and Mark Frost, like Patrick McGowan before them, didn't really care what something meant. The idea was that was up to the viewer. So this video won't try to explain Twin Peaks, to interpret it, to denigrate it or defend it. We'll give you our take, as we always do. And as always, that's all we really can do. This man, I know him. Twin Peaks was a series that ran for two seasons from 1990. It quickly became a massive overnight success, built on the back of a central murder mystery. It came from nowhere, and just as quickly disappeared after the show split off into more directions than a compass factory explosion. He has engaged us in subterfuge and red herring. A fish I don't particularly care for. And it's weird. I mean, it starts off fairly normally, a bucolic town, very sleepy, quirky characters, but then it has these slight digressions. And then once the show gets its head of steam, it goes places. I mean, it goes to really strange places, like wherever the hell you're watching this from, you weirdo. Well, these are fresh. Here you go, Gary. Oh, thanks. Twin Peaks gets weird and would venture into the realm of the supernatural. Mix the Andy Griffith show with Dragnet, Beverly Hills 90210 and hallucinations from eating hot chili or from suffering concussion from a major head trauma and you realistically end up with something that's not really like but sort of is just like Twin Peaks, possibly. You dig? Just you. The network wanted a modern update on Peyton Place and instead they got a show where a lady carried a log, where a man in Washington state professed a liking for coffee and where the most popular girl in school wasn't likely to be giving a very long speech on graduation day. <laughs> Laura Palmer was a high school student who also volunteered with Meals on Wheels, but she was also a hooker advertising in magazines, a heavy drug user, and at the start of the series, quite, quite dead. Laura Palmer was murdered, but by whom? You think I killed her? FBI Special Agent Dale Cooper arrives in Twin Peaks, where he's just fascinated by the array of trees. I've never seen so many trees in my life. He's entranced by the pie. This must be where pies go when they die. And of course, the coffee. A damn fine cup of coffee. He teams up with local sheriff Harry S. Truman, huh, to unpick the web of intrigue surrounding Laura's killing. There's a sort of evil out there. Something very, very strange in these old woods. Truth be told, the town is full of intrigues, but given the show's location, it's probably easiest to visualize everything using a tree of drama, where the entirety of how everything links together in Twin Peaks is finally, well, if not clear, at least visual, which of course is very important for the medium of video. It's Laura. Laura Palmer, it turns out, was having affairs with him, and also him, and maybe him, and working for him as a prostitute. Finally abused and killed by, well, we'll come back to that. Laura's official boyfriend, Bobby Briggs, was a local hoodlum also having an affair with Shelley Johnson, whose abusive husband, Leo Johnson, is a smuggler, among other things. Shelley works at the Double R Diner owned by Norma, whose own husband, Hank, is about to be released from jail, where he's into all manner of shady things, while Norma is having an affair with Big Ed, who's married to Nadine, whose relationship with reality is strained. Completely silent. 
Laura's best friend, Donna Haywood, is only now getting to know what her best friend was really like. But she's got a thing for Laura's ex, James, and pretty soon, Laura's almost identical cousin, Maddie, turns up and may also have a thing for James. Also, Maddie seems to have no problem popping on a blonde wig to make people think they're seeing a ghost. I mean, her Halloween costume is set for years. James and I knew Laura better than anyone did. She was in some kind of terrible trouble before she died, worse than any of us could imagine. Meanwhile, rich girl Audrey Horn is finding her relationship with her dad, Ben Horn, is strained, no matter what she does, and she zeroes in on Agent Cooper as somebody who understands her. Audrey falls for Cooper, but him being a stand-up guy, he resists temptation. Fellas, don't drink that coffee. Local fisherman Pete Martell first found Laura Palmer. There was a fish in the percolator. His scheming wife, Catherine Martell, is half owner of the local mill, while her sister-in-law, Josie Packard, has inherited an interest in the mill after inheriting it from her dead husband, Andrew, who's Catherine's brother. Catherine is also seeing Ben. Ben, of course, owns a department store and the town's hotel, The Great Northern. And he's trying to put together various deals, one of which involves gaining control of the mill, one way or the other. Ben, along with his brother, Jerry, huh? Have fingers in so many pies in Twin Peaks, both literal and metaphorical, when you consider that Ben owns the nearby brothel and casino One Eye Jacks, where it transpires Laura Palmer worked. Ben Horn's businesses are spread across the entire legal spectrum. Legal, not so legal, less than legal, and straight up a shortcut to 20 to life, which on balance most of those actually just mean illegal, where he's scheming with Catherine Martell and conspiring against her, while also doing business with the likes of Leo and Hank. Leo Johnson's gonna get a house call. Proceed. Laura Palmer's mother is having visions, while her father Leland is having public breakdowns every week. His hair also turns white overnight. James and Donna and Laura's cousin Maddie begin their own investigation into Laura's death, while Audrey Horn looks at Laura's path from working in her father's department store to working in her father's brothel. But she comes a cropper when her amateur sleuthing goes awry. It's Nancy Drew and Scooby-Doo mixed in with Saved by the Bell, except here their friend Laura Palmer was an abused coke-head call girl. I've got cookies. No cake. Well, that's very kind of you, ma'am, but I don't believe that... What kind of cookies? Owen, Harry is seeing the widow Josie Packard, who appears to have been coerced into marrying into the Martells, where she had also hired Hank to kill her husband Andrew. An attempt to burn down the mill with Shelley tied up intersects with Catherine's latest plot, and well, Catherine Martell is thought to have died in the fire. Looks like a new pair of boots and a lot of cocaine. There's a pecking order of the local scumbags involved in various criminal goings on, from Bobby to Leo to Hank who are one way or another, or possibly several ways, linked to the likes of Josie, Catherine, Ben, and for a time, Jean Renault. More people end up dead or injured. The abuse of Leo ends up in a vegetative state, and Agent Cooper is shot, but he quickly bounces back. If they're not screwing each other in business, then they're doing it literally in a motel room. You just shut your mouth! I'm getting quite dizzy, to be honest, in trying to catalogue Twin Peaks' drama tree. But you at least can create your own drama tree at home on TwinPeakistry.com. How much does it cost? Oh, money is no object, little Nicholas. <laughs> Go! Logic and Twin Peaks intersect about as rarely as a BMW driver intersects with a turn signal. Bacon, super crispy, almost burned, cremated. And then just weird things happen. One day, my log will have something to say about this. Cooper has visions of a giant and a little man. Oh, not... He has visions of himself as an older man, of a woman who looks like Laura, and of course, they're all speaking backwards. There's talk of Cooper's former partner, Wyndham Earl, who's implied to have gone round the twist. Every spirit must pass through there on the way to perfection. Sheriff Truman's deputies include Native American Hawk, who seems to be open to Cooper's odder methods of detection, and Andy, who finds the grimmer aspects of police work tough to swallow. There are not just three men on a fishing trip, they're a whole, they're a whole damn town. town. Andy and the station receptionist Lucy have an on-again, off-again relationship which is played for laughs. I'm gonna transfer to the phone on the table by the red chair, the, the red chair against the wall. Uh, the little table. The trail for the killer leads to the one-armed man, Philip Michael Gerard, who, when he doesn't get his anti-schizophrenia medication, can sometimes channel a being called Mike. Who was friends with this guy? Bob or Killer Bob will occasionally show up. No one actually really sees him, or do they? He might appear in a reflection, or in a vision, or a dream. 
The first season of Twin Peaks ended without revealing the identity of Laura's killer. But Cooper took a few bullets. Ooh, exciting. <laughs> the television landscape in 1990 wasn't all that different from how it had been for decades. Prestige drama in the US was still mostly the province of big networks, and in the 80s it tended to be miniseries events, alongside a few well-regarded one-hour shows. There was also the relatively new Fox network trying to gain market share. TV programs, though, still mostly looked like a television show. They looked rarely as good or as well made as a feature, since the small screen usually had a much smaller budget and much shorter filming schedules than a feature. And while you had a drama here and there that pushed the medium forward, it was slow going. Once a day, give yourself a present. Don't plan it, don't wait for it, just let it happen. By the late 80s, the American ABC network had fallen to the number three position in terms of viewing figures, and out of a desperate need to restore some life into the network, executives there greenlit a number of risky programs that were somewhat different from what they had usually been broadcasting. The biggest chance of all, a one-hour drama from a director known for weird feature films. Holy smokes, who is that? Twin Peaks wasn't the first show to feature slightly offbeat characters, but so quickly became weird for the sake of being weird that it was at the forefront of a new wave of programming that really did push the envelope of TV drama. Picket fences, northern exposure, and if you want to drop cop rock into the conversation, then please don't. David Lynch had burst onto the scene with the indie darling Eraserhead, which led to his acclaimed film The Elephant Man, produced by Mel Brooks, which eventually led to a troubled and truncated version of Dune in 1984. Ordered by whom? His next film, Blue Velvet, showed Lynch was not somebody who was just going to make an ordinary police procedural. Mark Frost's writing career started with episodes of The Six Million Dollar Man. He eventually worked on Hill Street Blues for a few years. That's a real mouthful, but I can't hear myself anyway. Lynch and Frost had collaborated on some unproduced scripts, and at one point the two had been eating in a diner, and thought how interesting it might be to look at the lives of the various people in the diner, but as viewed through Lynch's eyes. Would you please ask the lady with the log to speak up? Um, the pie. She was talking about the cherry pie. To make it feel more like a television show than a fly-on-the-wall documentary or a sitcom, they felt a murder mystery might draw people in. From Lynch and Frost's perspective, the mystery part of Twin Peaks was just some window dressing rather than the main event. So let's see how that works out for them. Mark Frost and David Lynch had worked on their idea, which is at one stage set in Dakota. They eventually moved it to Washington State and called their script Northwest Passage. There are irrefutable similarities that for obvious reasons I cannot discuss that lead us to conclude that Laura Palmer was the second and Ron Pulaski would have been the third victim of the same killer. A pilot was produced where, if nothing else, they'd at least have a cool TV movie to show for it, with a theatrical release already planned for Europe. Twin Peaks pilot, directed by David Lynch, is beautifully shot, mainly on location in Snoqualmie and North Bend in Washington State. Oh, it fell down. The first episode takes its time to establish the characters of Twin Peaks. It starts off like a relatively straight murder mystery, where people are processing the news of Laura Palmer's death in their own way. And then every now and then, you'll get a hint that it's not quite as simple as it first appears, like a calculator app once you accidentally switch it to scientific mode, and then you can't work out how to switch it back to simple mode. Where the man said rain. We get paid that kind of money for being wrong 60% of the time and be working. The pilot was played relatively straight, with only a few digressions into slightly odd material, but it was loved by most people who saw it. ABC, for their part, weren't keen on greenlighting further episodes. It took a grassroots campaign of Lynch and Frost showing the pilot to anybody with a shred of influence in Hollywood before the network greenlit a short series of seven episodes to add to the pilot. Great! Pay dirt! Pilot and the rest of the first season would be written and in the can before television audiences saw any of it. I am first going to tell you a little bit about the country called Tibet. Lynch and Frost had the interiors from the pilot recreated in a warehouse in the San Fernando Valley in California. Location filming on series episodes was likewise conducted around Southern California, with production designers and camera operators often wrestling with shooting around the abundant palm trees in California. It happens all the time in movie and television production. I remember the time I had to paint 1,000 horseflies with yellow spray paint in order to simulate a swarm of bees. Now, I don't know about you, but if you think your job sucks, 
Try stopping 1,000 freshly painted horseflies from sitting on your car. When Twin Peaks premiered on ABC in early 1990, audiences went wild. Ratings started off high, but tapered off throughout the season. But the numbers didn't tell the whole story of the hysteria associated with the show. People became obsessed with Twin Peaks, its coterie of oddball and over-caffeinated characters. People carried logs. Okay, look, so some of the time, some of those people were just carrying from the wood pile to the fireplace, but you get the general idea. The obsession with the identity of Laura Palmer's killer reached a fever pitch. As is the case here in Twin Peaks, even this bucolic hideaway is filled with secrets. The network received pressure from bigwigs in Hollywood, from world leaders, from Mrs. Eileen Barkin Lederworth, who may sound like some random made up person, but may in fact possibly be notable for being the first person to ever enter Comic Con while wearing deodorant. Twin Peaks combined elements from police procedurals, art house films, Norman Rockwell paintings, noir thrillers, soap operas, and comedies. And it's all wrapped in wood. I mean, there was wood everywhere, literally wood building exteriors, interiors, set decorations. The only thing more tragic than Laura Palmer's death, honestly, termites. Really weird stuff. Some of David Lynch's work could be described as kinky, a little sadomasochistic. A masochist enjoys pain, like watching every episode of Wings, while a sadist is where you enjoy inflicting pain on others, like making somebody watch every episode of Wings. Twin Peaks was still on network television, so it was subject to ABC's Standards and Practices Department, so there was no overt swearing or nudity. Though by the late 80s, some of what was once not acceptable was by then acceptable. So we accepted it. I'm going to give little Elvis a bath. Except him. There's a timelessness to the series. I mean, Laura Palmer was killed in early 1989, but many of the following episodes take place over a very compressed time frame. Lynch was not averse to improv and coming up with ideas on the fly, and it's his eye for the unusual that made Twin Peaks so memorable. He'd often film something that looked interesting without an idea of how it would be at all relevant to the plot or the characters. Am I right? Am I right? Special Agent Cooper seemed like a straight-laced character who seems to have a fascination with anything to do with Twin Peaks. <laughs> he would use whatever method he needed to help solve the crime, whether it was something he saw in a dream, pure chance, or any type of spirituality. Jelly Donuts? Harry, that goes without saying. Kyle McLaughlin's first movie role was in David Lynch's Dune adaptation, and Lynch also used him in Blue Velvet. Special Agent Dale Cooper would be the role that McLaughlin would most be associated with, which was not so much an albatross, more of a pigeon carrying a small bag of cash. Diane, it's 11.05 p.m. I'm in my room at the Great Northern Hotel. There's not a star in the sky tonight. He's constantly dictating memos to his secretary, Diane, who would not be seen until a much later third season of Twin Peaks. So she does exist eventually. So Cooper isn't just talking into an empty cassette player with flat batteries. Harry, we can't let personal feelings interfere with our work. Easier said than done. Michael Onkeen played straight man to everyone, a relatively normal person in a town that was anything but normal. Yeah, I know. A lot of the rest of the cast were pulled from people whose careers were now long past their heyday. Peggy Lipton had been in the early 70s cop show The Mod Squad. Richard Beam and Russ Tamlin had both been young actors in the 60s and had both been in West Side Story. Piper Laurie had won an Academy Award and she'd been acting since the 1960s, but by the 90s was possibly best known for her unique method of stopping flying knives in the film Carrie. Jack Nance had been the lead in David Lynch's debut film Eraserhead and at one point was even married to log lady Catherine E. Coulson. There are also the relatively fresh faces. Joan Chen had recently appeared in The Last Emperor. I had a feeling that Laura was in trouble. Cheryl Lee was a day player on the pilot to basically play Laura Palmer's corpse, shoot a few photographs and flashbacks, and that was it. She was brought back to the series to play Laura's cousin, Maddie. Cheryl and Fenn had to conjure up some weird dances in a character who wanted to see what her father was up to, but who also fell for Cooper. I can't tell you all my secrets. After the show gained traction, she lobbied producers to make Audrey less of a sexy character. Conversely, Lara Flynn Boyle, who played Laura's relatively innocent best friend Donna, wanted her character to be sexier. Hence, she leaves behind the Nancy Drew act and instead vamps it up as a film noir femme fatale, smoking and saying very little. Donna, what's wrong? Nothing. Donna falls for one of Laura's boyfriends, James. And then she becomes jealous of Maddie, while later on, when James is a fling with an older woman, she doesn't seem to care all that much, Daddy-o. 
Lara Flynn Boyle would skip the prequel movie but would go on to be a rare Twin Peaks cast member remembered more for other roles. Hi, Wang. Madge and Amick was cast as waitress Shelley, who has a thing for bad boys, douchebags, and any hybrid of the two. And this is the starter in the coffin. <laughs> Dana Ashbrook was the floppy head Bobby Briggs, who starts off the series as a nasty piece of work transporting drugs and then tries to rehabilitate himself. Everybody knew she was in trouble, but we didn't do anything. James Marshall as biker James Hurley seems to be channeling James Dean, but the writers seem to have lost interest in anything called James. I think that, you know, I'm gonna catch a glimpse of her out of the corner of my eye. Sometimes it's like I really do see her. In the second season, particularly after the reveal of Laura's killer, the younger characters seem to flail about, as writers tried in vain to find something for them to do. An original plan was to have Cooper and Audrey hook up, but this idea was nixed by McLaughlin and possibly his then real-life girlfriend, Lara Flynn Boyle, which more or less explains why Billy Zane and Heather Graham show up in the latter part of the series. Well, for starters, where the hell you been the past two weeks? And then people come back from death or even near death quite a bit. Leo had been shot and declared to be in a non-communicative state, needing round-the-clock care from Shelley and Bobby, who think Leo's now their ticket to a successful insurance scam. Ice cream. <laughs> Leo does emerge, sort of. Catherine Martell had been thought dead, but then she comes back, and for some reason made up as a Japanese businessman. Her brother Andy, Josie's husband, well guess what, he turns out he wasn't all that dead either. Does that mean there's a chance for Laura? Now she's dead. Her cousin Maddie is also offed. Many of the alliances in Twin Peaks were a double-edged sword, just like the actual sword thrust into your back by your Twin Peaks allies. Catherine and Ben turn on each other, Hank seems to be working for whoever, and Josie seems to be the epicenter of multiple murder and business plots. I have had an absolutely killer schedule. Josie's abusive and manipulative ex, Thomas Eckhart, comes to town and he's killed. Just as he's conspiring to kill, well, I forget he was trying to kill, but Josie kills him and then she dies. Josie had been the one who tried to kill Cooper. So after all of that, it turns out that Josie ended up being a bit of a knob. <laughs> Big Ed was married to Nadine, but his heart was with Norma. Nadine's attempted suicide left her mind in an even more confused state, and she regressed, thinking she's a teenager still in high school. Nadine has also somehow developed super strength. The town psychiatrist, Dr. Jacoby, a quacks quack if ever there was one, recommends everybody playing along. Nadine ends up as a school wrestling champ and develops an infatuation for Bobby's high school friend, Mike. Bobby's father, Major Briggs, at first seems like he's deeply disappointed in his wayward son, but that turns out to not be the case. I'm so glad to have had this opportunity to share it. Major Briggs would also prove pivotal to the search for the show's ultimate MacGuffin, the Black Lodge. Also, was he kidnapped by aliens or someone else? What was the deal? After watching Twin Peaks, sometimes I think that I may have been kidnapped by aliens. Every time she tried to make the world a better place, something terrible came up inside her and pulled her back down. Dr. Jacoby does seem to be about the worst psychiatrist ever. Worse than that one step away from serial killer Dr. Frazier Crane. I want you to bring my father back. To the office? Parade. Rest! To the real world. Dr. Jacoby had been sleeping with one troubled patient and allows two others to live elaborate fantasies for extended periods without actually treating them. And there's this. General Grant. General because the show was successful, they were able to attract lots of guest stars. We've already seen Dan O'Hurley and David Warner. There's a few episodes for Billy Zane to just show up, bat eyelids at Audrey, and then bugger off. Also, pro tip, if the private jet is rockin', don't come knockin'. Michael Parks shows up for a bit as the nasty villain Jean Renault with an even nastier accent. Lenny Von Dolan appears as Shut In Harold. David Duchovny appears in an early role as a scene-stealing transgender FBI agent, Denise. We have women agents? More or less. For the last few episodes, Canadian actor Harry Welch appeared as the master of disguise nutcase, Wyndham Earl. 
Also, since any romance between Cooper and Audrey had been nixed, Heather Graham will appear as Norma's ex-nun sister, Annie. Cooper's latest reason to stay in Twin Peaks, because apparently the coffee wasn't enough. Now, Dale, listen carefully. It's your move. It's at this point that the Tree of Drama servers crashed and we had to complete the rest of the video using bananas to represent the characters. We think he murdered his parents. He's nine years old. Steven Spielberg was at one point poised to direct the second season opener, while actor Diane Keaton directed one episode of Twin Peaks while launching her new career as a television director in the early 90s. I've got a lot of cutting and pasting to do, gentlemen, so please, why don't you return to your porch rockers and resume whittling? Several times throughout the series, FBI forensic specialist Albert Rosenfeld, played by Miguel Ferrer, shows up in Twin Peaks. <laughs> Initially, he has nothing but disdain for Twin Peaks, the locals, and especially the sheriff and his deputies. <laughs> That's a way of living I thought had vanished from the earth, but it hasn't, Albert. It's right here in Twin Peaks. Sounds like you've been snacking on some of the local mushrooms. But he does eventually connect with the locals. Looking good, Harry. <laughs> the character of Josie was originally meant to be Italian, played by Isabella Rossellini, but the character was rewritten for Joan Chen when Rossellini was unavailable. You think they'll kill me too? To play every American's least flattering image of an Englishman, Scottish-born actor and soap star Ian Buchanan played Richard Tremaine. Here's to the children. <laughs> <laughs> Peggy Lipton's Mod Squad co-star Clarence Williams III also pops up as an FBI man investigating Cooper, and there are also a few blink and you'll miss them appearances by Molly Shannon, Ted Raimi, Brenda Strong, Gavin O'Hurlihy, and Laverne and Shirley's David L. Lander. Killer Bob was Frank Silver, a props man on the show, who one day was accidentally in shot. Lynch loved this image and shot some footage of Silver looking creepy, when David Lynch had to deliver a version of the pilot for release in Europe, complete with the killer unmasked, he quickly shot some footage with Silver as Laura's murderer. Who or what was Bob? A demon? A killer? A figment of various people's imaginations? All of the above or none of the above? Fans have their theories, of course, but like a lot of unanswered questions in Twin Peaks, there is no definitive answer. I have my own theories about many things, like how I firmly believe that the killer in David Finch's movie telling the story of the real-life Zodiac killer is indeed Yoda. There's nothing quite like urinating out in the open air. I look forward to hearing more about this White Lodge. Occasionally when working on a review, the idea of working on a review ends up in my dreams. For days while watching Twin Peaks, I had dreams about how I would incorporate an accident on set where some special effect using a helicopter rotor went wrong and someone was apparently killed, but then they still used the footage in the show. I did not, however, drink any coffee, but I think falling asleep under a wonky ceiling fan may have had something to do with it. It's not as bad as I made it out to be. Frost and Lynch had brought in other writers during the show's first season, Harley Payton and Robert Engels, who seemed in sync with Lynch and Frost's vision. The owls are not what they seem. For the show's second season, Lynch and Frost were less hands-on. Lynch still directed episodes and made time to appear as scene-stealing Gordon. By this time, Mark Frost and David Lynch were each working on separate projects, which left Payton and Engels to carry the show. Lynch and Frost, by some accounts, weren't working as closely as before, and it's been suggested that Lynch seemed to lose some interest in the show when it was less David Lynch now that it had become so popular, and the demand for answers outstripped his supply of weird. What the hell's going on? You are witnessing a front three-quarter view of two adults sharing a tender moment. The pressure to resolve the mystery at the heart of the series went to the very top. Everybody wanted to know who the hell killed Laura Palmer. Lynch and Frost had never been interested in resolving the mystery, feeling the characters in the town were what the show was actually about. In the middle of the show's second season, Laura's killer is abruptly revealed. Now, if you haven't seen Twin Peaks but are still interested, stop watching now. Stop watching now because we're about to talk about who killed Laura Palmer. Oh, so glad they're gone. Never liked them. It turns out her father, Leland Palmer, was possessed by the demonic presence of Killer Bob. He also killed his niece Maddie and came close to killing Donna before he's finally cornered. Leland died in Cooper's arms with his own personality briefly returning. But Killer Bob is still around. Harry, is it easier to believe a man would rape and murder his own daughter? Any more comforting? No. 
In order to preserve the mystery of Laura's killer, Maddie's death had been shot three times with different perpetrators, meaning Cheryl Lee had to film the harrowing scene again and again. Yes, they're actors, that's what they do. But that doesn't mean filming a scene like this isn't draining both physically and emotionally. In hindsight, it may not have always been Leland Palmer from the start, but Ray Wise's fantastic performance of Leland losing his marbles doesn't end up surprising anyone. I feel happy. <laughs> I feel happy. After Leland died, shattered at what had happened by his hand, the show would pivot to other mysteries, other plots. Of course, none of which seemed half as compelling as the Laura Palmer mystery. There is a, let's be charitable, and say a massive dip in quality in the episodes directly after the reveal of Laura's killer, where there's a fair chance that almost every plotline from Twin Peaks that you hated stemmed from the half dozen or so episodes in the middle of the season. Now that's an understatement. Hurry James, go find that young girl who loves you. Ben Horn has a breakdown where he thinks he's a Confederate general and is only brought back to reality by reliving the Confederate surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. Do you remember? Oh yes, yes, it was a good, good war as I remember. James meets another femme fatale, even more femme fatale than Donna had become and is briefly wanted for murder of the femme fatale's husband. I think his name is John Femme Fatale, anyway. Another deeply unpopular story arc, Little Nicky and the love triangle between Lucy, Andy and Dick. That should do it. Second part of the season is the lead up to the big confrontation between unhinged but brilliant Wyndham Earl and Cooper. Earl had been an FBI agent who's gone rogue. Cooper had an affair with Earl's wife, Earl killed her, and he's now returned for revenge, involving an extended chess game with multiple killings around Twin Peaks. I've just returned from a place called Owl Cave. How I got there is a rather complicated story. There's a White Lodge and a Black Lodge, which is apparently somewhere near Twin Peaks. And it's not really explained what it is, it's a doorway to somewhere, maybe it's a different dimension, or a five guys with nicer curtains. Wyndham Earl is searching for the Black Lodge for his own reasons, while Cooper believes they need to find it first. They have various clues, people's odd tattoos, some petroglyphs which need deciphering. And then what happened? It was a brief but touching funeral. Twin Peaks ratings in the Saturday night time slot were sliding compared to its original Thursday night slot. The show was put on hiatus, then brought back, but mainly just to burn off the remaining episodes. And so, Twin Peaks on television ended in 1991. The finale was where things went places, jettisoning all traces of Twin Peaks being about a murder in a small town. Cooper finally finds the entrance to the Black Lodge. It's some curtains in the forest. The lodge itself looks a lot like the red room seen by Cooper in his visions and his dreams with the man from another place, the giant and Laura, all speaking backwards but forwards. Hello, Thankfully, however, the Black Lodge provides a quality subtitle service. Cooper finds himself in a labyrinth, seeing more or less Laura, Maddie, Leland Palmer, Earl's dead wife mixed in with Coop's later squeeze, Annie, and of course, Bob. David Lynch directed the finale and ditched much of the script in favour of improvising something that was weird and visually arresting. David Lynch didn't care much for Earl as a character, which is probably why he's dealt with without much fuss or screen time. I'm in the Black Lodge. If you wanted answers, you won't get them. We learn next to nothing about the Black Lodge other than there are a awful lot of curtains, and truth be told, they're dust magnets. Also, Lynch, if nothing else, really liked having old guys walking really slowly. Twin Peaks ended with, uh, let's see, Cooper is trapped in the lodge while a doppelganger obsessed with dental hygiene wakes up in Twin Peaks. I need to brush my teeth. Earl is killed, Annie is injured, Donna had briefly thought Ben Horn might be her dad but decided Dr. Hayward was her dad after all. You're my daddy. You're my daddy. You're my daddy. Yet Dr. Hayward also may have killed her actual dad, as far as we knew at the time. James had ridden off into, well, I don't know if anybody cared. Nadine had come to her senses, relatively speaking, which put a kibosh on Hank and Norma. Lucy and Andy have ended the series as a couple. Andrew Packard, Pete Martell and Audrey have all possibly been killed in a bank vault explosion. And I think Leo is trying to not be eaten by spiders. Huzzah! Hello there, little pilgrim. <laughs> Just 30 episodes of Twin Peaks were made, though that wasn't the end of the matter. I'll see you again in 25 years. 
Me Noel. In 1992, David Lynch made Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me, a film that was mainly a prequel showing the last few days of Laura Palmer's life before her murder. A lot of the television cast returned, apart from Lara Flynn Boyle, and Donna was played by actress Moira Kelly. I was standing right behind you, but you're too dumb to turn around. And then there's David Bowie, Chris Isaac, and Kiefer Sutherland. As a feature film, it does not have the same limits on violence and nudity as television. Fire Walk With Me is grimmer, it's darker, it seems to be thrown together much more than the TV show. Kyle McLaughlin originally declined to return, so new FBI agents were created, but then McLaughlin agreed to return for a few scenes as Cooper. Cooper now seems to instinctively know the future, which is a problem with a lot of prequels. What color hair will she have? Long. Many of the TV cast returned, including a few dead characters, yet a lot of the returning cast found their roles on the cutting room floor. A 2014 compilation of deleted and alternate scenes was released as a companion piece to this movie. That being said, the movie just seems to make Twin Peaks seem that bit less wonderful. If I were to rewatch the series at some point, I would possibly skip Firewalk with me. But for obsessive compulsive Twin Peaks completionists, what are you going to do? Not watch it? Those deleted or alternate scenes were included in a release called The Missing Pieces, which was released just as a new limited television series was in development. Twin Peaks The Return was shown in 2017 and continued Agent Cooper's story after he was lost for decades. The final season of Twin Peaks was Lynch and Frost writing every episode and Lynch directing each installment. Many of the original cast returned along with a number of new characters. Twin Peaks of the Return was weird and freaky for people who'd come to think of the original as an absolute baseline for weird and freaky. He's dead. It also goes much harder into horror territory than the 90s series. Time to face the music. Angelo Badalamenti scored many films in his career, but he was David Lynch's go-to composer. His score for Twin Peaks is dark feeling, yet bright sounding. His Twin Peaks theme is unmistakable, with its ethereal sound and twangy bass guitar sample. A vocal version sung by Julie Cruz became a chart topper as it was released at the height of Twin Peaks mania. Laura Palmer's theme closed out most episodes and is almost as memorable as the theme tune. I think I've gone blind in my left eye. David Lynch would go on to make more films and occasionally toyed with TV ideas. Mark Frost, whose name often gets overlooked in reference to Twin Peaks, would work on many projects, with the most baffling being the two Fantastic Four movies of the 2000s. Twin Peaks was very much a combination of Frost's talent as a writer and Lynch's as a director. Lynch himself often has to stop and remind people that Twin Peaks is a 50-50 split between him and Frost. Then you have diehard Twin Peaks fans who will try to connect the dots of whatever the pair had left behind in order to, perhaps with a sense of futility, try to explain absolutely everything. Look. I dig, I've tried to work out the mystery of how all those empty bottles from my recycling bin magically disappear every two weeks. And last night, I had another Monica Bellucci dream. <laughs> at this point, we should point out the Twin Peaks predated the True Crime podcast. Also, at this point, we should announce our own True Crime podcast, Stam Crime. Here's a sample Bend, Oregon. On the night of January 13, 1986, a man, David Gary Dickenhead, pulls up to a gas station and freezes to death in his car when there's nobody on duty to pump gas. The police said it was death by natural causes. But over the next 60 hours, we will prove with a reasonable doubt that Dickenhead was actually killed by Bigfoot wielding a flamethrower. Also, huge shout out to our million subscriber. You in a tote bag with our logo. What's all this got to do with Twin Peaks? Hell if I know. Twin Peaks was Nepo Baby Epicenter. Peggy Lipton's daughter is Rashida Jones, director Caleb Deschanel and his wife, series regular Mary Jo Deschanel, are parents to actors Emily and Zoe. Co-creator Mark Frost's father, Warren, played Dr. Haywood, and his brother contributed to scripts. Director Stephen Gyllenhaal is the father of actors Jake and Maggie. Eric DeRay was the son of actor Aldo Ray and casting director Joanna Ray. And David Lynch has his own mini-me appear in one episode. Meanwhile, this review was edited by my own offspring, Snips Fine. But the true test of any hotel, as you well know, Diane, is that morning cup of coffee, which I'll be getting back to you about within a half hour. I skipped Twin Peaks back in the day. I was aware of the hoopla, but by the time it screened locally, I just wasn't interested. Having watched it now, 
I really quite enjoyed it. I mean, it's weird, but it's no cop rock. On the other hand, thank fuck it's not cop rock. Twin Peaks does get weird and does not go out of its way to explicitly explain what it is you're seeing. Some folks absolutely need to know. So fans have found various ways to try and explain the gaps or fill in the gaps. I don't think David Lynch or Mark Frost and company really cared about explaining absolutely everything. Which is why Twin Peaks works. I plan on writing an epic poem about this gorgeous pie. It's not a show about answers, but about questions. It's now. It's relevant. It's global. Twin Peaks is weird and wonderful, crazy and touching, odd and interesting. And that is some damn fine coffee. Take another look, Sonny. It's going to happen again. If you enjoyed this review, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos. What is your reaction, Lucy?